Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week we are going to be talking about the solved case of Wesley Neely. He was an 11 year old boy from the northeast of England who mysteriously disappeared one summer's afternoon in 1998 after having gone out to the local shop to buy himself some sweets. When Wesley didn't return home and the police were notified of his disappearance, search efforts began to try and find him. But tragically, weeks went by and there was very little movement in the case. The police had no idea what happened to Wesley on the afternoon that he vanished, or at least that was until until they received this one tip from a member of the public, a tip that broke the case wide open and would eventually lead them to uncovering the heartbreaking truth about what happened to Wesley Neely and who was responsible for his murder. But just before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young child and it involves heavy themes such as rape and sexual abuse against children, paedophilia and the theme of suicide is briefly mentioned. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back about 25 years now to the summer of 1998 in Newcastle, Newcastle upon Tyne, which is located in the northeast of England. And this is Wesley Neely. He was a young boy who lived in Newcastle with his family. Specifically, they lived in an area called Arthur's Hill in Newcastle. Wesley was just 11 years old when this case took place. He was born on the 29th of December 1986. His mother was called Liz and I actually couldn't find the name of Wesley's father anywhere. I'm unsure as to whether or not his father was really in the picture. But he lived with his mum Liz and Wesley was one of two children. He had a little brother named Robert who was just four years old. So Wesley was around six to seven years older than him. And Wesley was just a very good and happy little boy. His mother Liz did described her son as being very caring and loving and helpful. She said that he had a very kind of straightforward personality. Wesley had a lovely little smile, he had a good sense of humour and he was very very close with his family, especially with his granddad Harry. He absolutely adored his granddad. His granddad would often look after the boys Wesley and Robert whilst their mum Liz was busy at work and they just got on so well. They always had so much fun together, they'd always laugh together. Wesley and his granddad just had such a special close bond. Wesley was also a very sociable boy. As far as I'm aware, he got on well at school. He always had friends at school. He was just a typical 11 year old boy in that sense. Although Wesley was an epileptic, he had recently been diagnosed with epilepsy, which I think did start to affect his attendance at school sometimes. He would have to miss school occasionally or, you know, be sent home from school, which is actually exactly what happened on the day that this case occurred. It was the 5th of June 1998. It was a Friday, so obviously a school day for Wesley, and he did go into school that morning. However, he wasn't there for very long. I think he was having some trouble with his epilepsy, and he just generally wasn't feeling well. So the school called his mum Liz, and she went to pick him up and bring him home. Wesley had a nap on the sofa when he got home. He slept and he rested for a about an hour and a half. And then thankfully, by the time he woke up, he was actually feeling so much better. Clearly that little nap that he had did him the world of good because he felt fine when he woke up. In fact, when he woke up, he even asked his mum Liz if he could please have 50 pence because he wanted to go to the local shop to buy some sweets for him and his little brother Robert for when Robert came home from nursery. And Liz said, yeah, okay. She gave him his 50 pence and with that, that Wesley left. He left at around 2 to 2.30 p.m. time, I think. He got on his bicycle, he had a pink and white bike, and he began cycling the short distance to the shop. This was a journey that I'm sure he had done many times before, as Wesley was trusted to go to the shop on his own. However, on this particular day, Wesley never returned home. After about 10 minutes or so, Liz started peeking out of the window to see if Wesley had arrived back yet, because the shop was 
literally only a couple of minutes away from their home so she didn't expect him to be more than 10 minutes so she kept looking out of the window expecting to see Wesley pull up outside on his bike but he was nowhere to be seen but she did see a couple of the other local kids hanging out outside so Liz went up to them and she asked if they had seen her son but they said that they hadn't and so it was then when Liz started to think oh well maybe Wesley's gone to his brother Robert's nursery because he knew that nursery ended soon it ended at around 3 p.m every day so Liz thought that maybe after going to the shop Wesley went straight to the nursery intent on meeting his mum and little brother there and so she headed to the nursery to collect Robert as usual but when she arrived there was still no sign of Wesley he wasn't in the playground and so after leaving the nursery Liz went to the local shop to see if for some reason Wesley was still in there getting his sweets but again he was not there. Liz asked the shop owner if they had seen Wesley had he been in the shop recently and the shop owner said yeah he'd come in like 20 minutes before and he'd got his sweets. The shop owner actually said that they gave Wesley his sweets for free because he gave them a hand by carrying some boxes out to the back of the shop for a few minutes before leaving. So Liz left the shop, she went back home expecting Wesley to be there but once again there was no sign of him and of course as time went by and he still didn't show up Liz was just starting to worry more and more especially because Wesley was due to take his epilepsy medication soon Liz just couldn't understand where Wesley might have gone I mean as I said before he was trusted to go out on his own to go to the local shop on his own and hang out with friends around the neighborhood because he was a well-behaved boy and I feel like back then a lot of parents did let their young kids go out alone. Nowadays I think parents are a lot more wary because they are more aware of the dangers but back then it was normal to let your kids play out and they were trusted to come back home. As I just said Wesley was always trusted to come back home which is why it was so strange that he hadn't yet. He always took his epilepsy medication at the same time every day in the early evenings. He would have known that he needed to come home to take it so why hadn't he? Liz headed back out and she started walking around the streets looking for Wesley. She was again asking the local kids if they had seen him on his bike. She was knocking on doors asking the neighbours if they had seen him. She spoke to her dad, Wesley's granddad Harry, who lived nearby, asking if he was with Wesley, if Wesley had popped round to his house, but he hadn't. It just seemed as though no one had any idea where he was. No one had seen him since he left the local shop with his sweets. No one knew where he went after that. And so later that evening, when there was still no sign of her son, Liz picked up the phone and she called the police to report him as missing. A police officer was sent to the Neely's address to speak with Liz. And to be honest, initially, it was pretty clear that the police did not take this very seriously at all. The officer just said that Wesley was probably out playing with friends. He even said to Liz that she was being an over-anxious mother. But Liz was insistent that no, something was wrong. She just had this gut feeling, probably mother's intuition, that something was not right here. She was panicking that Wesley might have been knocked off his bike and that he was lying in a ditch somewhere injured or that he had had an epileptic fit. All of these horrible thoughts and scenarios were just going round and round in her head. So yeah, she was adamant that something must have happened to her son and so the police search for 11 year old Wesley Neely began. They had a quick look around the Neely's home just to double check that he definitely wasn't there and then they started looking around the local area and it wasn't just the police out searching. Family members and friends and a lot of the local people, neighbours went out searching too. Word spread quickly that Wesley was missing and everyone just wanted to help find him. But despite all these volunteers, no one found anything. They didn't find Wesley that night. The search for Wesley continued the next morning and even more officers and search teams were assigned to the case to look for him. They were looking everywhere. They were searching along the streets, in local parks and fields, in alleyways. Search dogs were brought in to assist with the investigation as well as helicopters who were going to get a better view of the area from above. 
love to see if they could spot Wesley. Missing posters with Wesley's face on were created and distributed around the local area. They were put up in shop windows and just in the windows of people's homes just to make people more aware of the case. And it wasn't long before something was found. It wasn't Wesley, but it was his bike. The day after Wesley disappeared, so this was the 6th of June 1998, a young local boy turned up at the Neely's address. He knocked on their front door and in his hands he had a hold of Wesley's bike, the pink and white bike that he took to the shop with him the previous day. And as soon as Wesley's mum Liz saw it, she asked this boy where did he get that bike? And the boy said that he'd recently seen these two young girls playing with it and he knew that it belonged to Wesley so he took it off of the girls and he decided to bring it back to Liz. And so these two girls were asked where they had found the bike and they said that they came across it just on the ground on a road called Wingrove Road which is about a 15 minute walk away from where Wesley lived. They just found it abandoned on Wingrove Road. There was no one with the bike and this immediately just made alarm bells ring even more because Wesley would never have just left his bike. He loved that bike. He was actually very attached to it as kids are. I remember how much I adored my first bike. So the fact that it had been found just discarded on Wingrove Road, it just made the family and everyone even more convinced that something bad must have happened to Wesley. It wasn't long before the police appealed to the media and the public for information. Alongside Wesley's family, they did a TV appeal, urging anyone with any information about Wesley's disappearance to come forward. And this case was literally all over the news. It was all over the newspapers and on the TV news channels, which was obviously a good thing because, of course, the more people hear about the case, the higher chance the police have of solving it and finding Wesley. And as a result of this media coverage, so many tips and leads came in. The police received countless calls from the public, many of which were actually potential sightings of Wesley. So many people rang the police saying, oh, I think I might have seen Wesley in this area or in this area, etc, etc. So they had a lot of leads to follow up on and look into. However, as the police went through every single reported sighting, unfortunately, every single time, they just seemed to be leading nowhere. It seemed as though the majority of these sightings were false. People had been mistaken. It wasn't Wesley that they had seen. But also it's believed that a lot of these sightings that people reported were what's apparently known as empathetic sightings. So a lot of these people hadn't actually seen Wesley, but they just said that they had because they felt bad for the family and they wanted to give them some hope, I guess, that Wesley was still alive, which I can understand. I can see where they're coming from. And from what I can gather, a lot of these sightings came from the kids at Wesley's school and the kids in the neighbourhood, his friends. So bless them, it was coming from a good place. But of course, in actual fact, it was actually doing a hell of a lot more harm to the investigation than good. It just made it harder for the police because they were having to spend time going through each sighting trying to confirm whether or not they were actually true when they weren't and this time could have otherwise been spent on actual credible leads. So yeah, unfortunately it seemed as though all of these potential sightings were just leading the police nowhere. It was just dead end after dead end. The search for Wesley continued over the coming days and weeks but there was nothing, no trace of Wesley and as time went by the police just started to believe more and more that Wesley may have been the victim of foul play, that Wesley was probably abducted on the day that he vanished and so they started looking into sex offenders and known paedophiles that lived nearby. However, as the police were doing this, another tip came in to the incident room, a tip that the detectives decided might be worth looking into further. They were contacted by a woman, a member of the public, and she actually worked 
as a social worker. She just wanted to notify the police that she knew of a young man who lived, I think, either on or very near Wingrove Road in Newcastle, the same road that Wesley's pink and white bike was found abandoned on. She said that she knew of this young man. His name was Dominic McKilligan. He was 18 years old at the time that this case occurred. And she just wanted to pass on his name to the detectives because she was aware that Dominic McKilligan had been trying to form relationships with young children with young boys inappropriate relationships so when this social worker heard about wesley neely's disappearance and that wesley's bike was discovered on a road close to where mckilligan lived she just thought that maybe he was someone that the police wanted to look at so they did as soon as they received this tip the detectives immediately started looking further into dominic mckilligan and what they found out about him was very disturbing and a huge cause for alarm. You see, Dominic McKilligan was actually a sex offender, a child sex offender. It turns out that Dominic McKilligan used to live in Bournemouth in Dorset, which is in the southwest of England. And whilst he was there, he was known to have sexually abused several young children. In fact, just a couple of years before this case took place in 1994, so when he was just 14 years old, he was convicted of gross indecency and indecently assaulting four young children. Children. He was a paedophile and experts deemed him to be, quote, seriously disturbed. As a result of this conviction, he was sent to a young offenders institution in County Durham and when he was released in September of 1997, he moved to Newcastle. He moved to Newcastle just the year before Wesley Neely's disappearance. However, despite this, the police and the authorities in Newcastle were actually not aware of him. He wasn't on their radar as someone that they should really keep an eye on because of the fact that he wasn't actually on the sex offenders register. You see, the sex offenders register in the UK was first established in September of 1997, around the same time that McKilligan was released from the Young Offenders Institution. In fact, it transpires that McKilligan was released just the day before the sex offenders register was introduced and because of this his name wasn't on it he literally missed it by one day had he been released just a day later his name would have been on it but because it was before it wasn't. So that meant that he was able to essentially fly under the radar as a child sex offender when he relocated to Newcastle. So when the detectives involved in Wesley Neely's disappearance heard about Dominic McKilligan, they were of course immediately suspicious of him. They immediately thought that this could be the guy. He could be the person responsible for Wesley's disappearance. Just an extra side note, another incredibly suspicious thing about Dominic McKilligan was that the police also learned that he was one of the people that called the tip line with a potential sighting of Wesley Neely, a sighting that was false. So that also made alarm bells ring because if he was involved in Wesley's case, possibly in his murder, then it seems likely that he did that. He put in this false sighting in an attempt to make it seem as though Wesley was still alive live and throw the police off of his scent. So now the police had a pretty strong suspect in the case and they decided to ask Dominic McKilligan to come in to the police station for an interview, which he did. He agreed to come in and the detectives noticed that he was very very relaxed, very calm. He didn't seem to be nervous in any way. If anything, he was the complete opposite. He seemed to be very confident and a tad arrogant, to be honest. He was clearly someone that thought he was so much smarter than anyone else, even smarter than the police. But he was answering all the questions that the detective was asking. And McKilligan said that he did know of Wesley Neely, but only from what he had seen about him on the news. He said that he was aware of Wesley's disappearance 
appearance but that he didn't know him personally and he denied having anything to do with whatever had happened to him. However, of course, the police were not convinced. They were still pretty suspicious of him and so they decided to conduct a search of his home to see if they could find anything in there that connected him to the case and they did find something. At Dominic McKilligan's address, they found in his dustbin a torn up check, a bank check for the amount of £150. This check was signed by McKilligan and it was made out to missing 11 year old Wesley Neely. So of course suspicion against McKilligan was just building and building and the detectives asked him about this check. Why the hell had he written out a check to Wesley? And apparently according to one documentary that I watched, initially McKilligan's story was that he signed his name on this check. It was his signature. However he claimed that someone else must have written Wesley Neely name on it without his knowledge and then they put it in his bin. So the detective sent this check off for examination to be looked at further and as a result of this experts were able to tell that the ink used to write McKilligan's name and Wesley's name was the same. The same pen had been used to write these two names and in addition to that handwriting experts were able to tell that whoever wrote McKilligan's name on the check also wrote Wesley's name. It was the same handwriting. So McKilligan's story that he wrote his name and someone else wrote Wesley's name was false. He had completely lied to the police. He wrote both names. He made this check out to Wesley. Now as all of this was going on, as these tests were being carried out, the police unfortunately could not hold McKilligan in custody because prior to this they had no solid evidence linking him to the case. So he was released after his interviews but unbeknownst to him the police decided to put him under surveillance and he started to display some very strange and concerning behavior whilst he was under surveillance. So for example he was seen doing odd things such as getting fake number plates made and putting them on cars for some reason. He was seen buying items like razor blades and he also bought quite a lot of aspirin medication. The police weren't sure what he was intending to do with these things but they had theories that perhaps he was either going to try and take his own life, maybe because he knew that the police were onto him, or that maybe he was going to use these items to hurt another child. Maybe he intended to use the aspirin to try and sedate a child so that he could abuse them. Who knows what his intentions were, but the police decided that they couldn't take a risk here. They knew his history and they couldn't risk him hurting another kid. So they decided to just arrest Dominic McKilligan. By this point, they had the evidence of the torn up check and the evidence from the handwriting experts. So they did have grounds to arrest him in relation to Wesley's disappearance. He was confronted with the check evidence. The police told him that they had evidence to prove that he was the one who wrote Wesley's name on it. And so... McKilligan decided to change his story. So before he had denied having any involvement in Wesley's case, but now he decided to admit that that was a lie. He said that he was responsible for Wesley's disappearance, but he claimed that he hadn't hurt Wesley and that Wesley was still alive. McKilligan told the police that on the afternoon Wesley went missing, he had abducted him, but he said, that he sold him. He gave Wesley to a paedophile ring. Now I think the police were a bit sceptical about this story. They weren't totally convinced that this was true but of course they had to look into it regardless. They had to investigate these claims just in case McKilligan was telling the truth and that Wesley was still alive and in the clutches of this paedophile ring group. Eventually McKilligan gave the detectives the name of an individual who he said was involved in this paedophile ring. 
going. So the police immediately started looking further into this individual. They put him under surveillance and they interviewed him. However, it soon became clear that he was innocent. He was not involved in any kind of paedophile group. It was clear that McKilligan had lied about this paedophile ring and that he tried to implicate this guy again in an attempt to throw the police off of his scent. I believe this guy was someone that McKilligan had met through an ad in the newspaper. They'd slept together before, but that was the extent of their relationship. And as I just said, McKilligan had clearly just given his name to the police to try and distract them from himself and send them off on a wild goose chase. So now that they had proved that this story about the paedophile ring was a lie, they confronted McKilligan once again. And so once again, he changed his story. He again said that yes, he was responsible for Wesley's abduction, but now he also said that as well as that, he was responsible for his death too. But he claimed that he didn't murder Wesley. He didn't mean to kill him. It was an accident. McKilligan's story was that on the day that Wesley went missing, the 5th of June 1998, he, I think, came across Wesley as he was on his way home from the local shop that afternoon after he had been in the shop to get his sweets. And he said that he offered Wesley some money. He wrote him out a check and said that he would give him £150 as long as, as I understand it, Wesley helped him to fix his car or maybe help clean his car or something, something to do with his car. And Wesley, being a young boy, obviously very excited over the prospect of earning £150, agreed and he went off with McKilligan. They went back to McKilligan's address, however McKilligan Milligan said that whilst they were there, he walked into the garage behind his home and he found Wesley climbing onto his car's roof and he got really, really angry at him and began shouting at him to get off of the car. And he said that as he was shouting, it obviously spooked Wesley because he fell off of the car and when he fell, he hit his head on a wrench that was on the ground and he started bleeding from his head and he was just lying on the ground unresponsive and McKilligan said that he just panicked. He didn't know what to do. He said that he didn't want to call the police or an ambulance because he was worried about how it would look. Because of his previous criminal convictions, he was scared that if he called the police and he told them what happened, they wouldn't believe him. They would think that he hit Wesley with the wrench and so he decided that instead of calling for help, he was going to kill Wesley and then hide his body. So he put a bin liner around Wesley's head and then he put his hands around his neck and started to squeeze. He strangled this 11 year old boy to death. After he was dead, McKilligan said that he put Wesley's body in his car and then he drove to a location where he disposed of his body. And he also ditched Wesley's bike just on the side of the road on Wingrove Road where it was later found by those two young girls. So that was Dominic's account of Wesley's death and in his interview he agreed to take the police to the location where he hid Wesley. He instructed the police to drive to a wooded area out in the countryside just outside of Newcastle and he pointed them to the spot where he said he left Wesley and sure enough in this spot the police found human remains. Wesley's body had been wrapped up in bin liners and then placed inside of a cardboard box. And when his body was discovered by the police, they noticed that his little shoes were just sticking out of the plastic bin liner. Now, Wesley's body was very decomposed by the time he was found. It was clear that he'd been in this spot since the day of his death. And by this point, it had been about a month since his disappearance. And obviously, it was June, it was the summer. And so naturally, that means that a body would decompose quicker in the heat. So yeah, he was pretty badly decomposed by this time to the point where he was basically unrecognisable. But the police knew that it was definitely Wesley because of the clothes that he was wearing. He had on the same clothes that he was wearing the day he vanished. And when the detective returned to the police car where Dominic was after having found Wesley's remains, 
Dominic actually said to the detective, quote, is it possible to have my car back now? Obviously, his car had been seized as part of the inquiry, and unbelievably, he clearly thought that he could just have it back now. He thought that if he told the police where Wesley's body was, that would be it. He'd be let go and they'd give his vehicle back to him. That's how little Dominic McKilligan cared about what had happened. He didn't care that Wesley was dead because of him. He just wanted his car back. So now that Wesley's body had been found, his family were informed of the devastating news and obviously McKilligan was kept in custody whilst police continued their inquiries. Forensic teams were sent to his home to thoroughly search the property and the police found absolutely no evidence to back up McKilligan's claims to back up his accident story. There was no evidence to suggest that Wesley was on the roof of his car like he said and that he fell off of the car. It was clear to the police that this was just another lie that McKilligan had told. The police strongly believed that Wesley's death was no accident at all. They believed that McKilligan lured Wesley to his home that day with the sole intention of sexually assaulting him and then killing him. And apparently the medical examiner was able to conclude during Wesley's autopsy that tragically Wesley had most likely been raped by his killer. I don't think they could say for absolute certain that he had been raped because of the fact that Wesley's body was very decomposed by the time he was found. But as I just said, the pathologist believed that he had probably been assaulted in that way. And so as well as being charged with murder, Dominic McKilligan was also charged with rape. He was charged with the rape and murder of 11-year-old Wesley Neely, to which McKilligan denied when it came to his plea hearing. He pleaded not guilty to both charges. And just as a side note, when Wesley's mother, Liz, saw her son's killer for the first time in court, she realised something. She realised that she had seen Dominic McKilligan before. She recognised his face. She recalled having seen Dominic McKilligan before Wesley's murder on the local school football field where Wesley was playing. Liz went to the field where Wesley was playing football one afternoon to tell her son that his dinner was ready back at home. And she remembered how, as she was shouting Wesley's name, McKilligan came up to her and asked if she was Wesley's mum, to which Liz said yes she was and she actually asked McKilligan if he could tell Wesley that his tea was ready and he said that he would. So yeah, Liz had met her son's killer before, before he even killed Wesley and how disturbing is that to think that Dominic McKilligan, this child sex offender, was on the field as these young boys were playing football. He was clearly watching them, watching Wesley. It makes you wonder if McKilligan had chosen Wesley specifically as being his victim way before his murder even took place. McKilligan's trial began in July of 1999, over a year after Wesley's death. The defence stuck to Dominic's accident story and the prosecution obviously refuted this and they presented their case to the jury on why they believed that this crime was a premeditated murder. And ultimately, at the end of the trial, it was announced that the jury agreed with the prosecution and that they had found Dominic McKilligan guilty of both rape and murder. And he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years and I believe an additional nine years for the rape charge. However, that is not where this case ends because pretty much immediately after McKilligan was convicted and sent away to prison, he launched an appeal. Specifically, he and his legal team appealed against the rape conviction and tragically this appeal was actually successful and his conviction for the rape of Wesley Neely was quashed. The reason being because, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately due to how decomposed Wesley's body was, obviously the pathologist was pretty certain that Wesley had been raped but they couldn't be 100% certain and so it was felt by the Court of Appeal 
appealed that there wasn't strong enough evidence to prove that McKilligan sexually assaulted Wesley and so the conviction was quashed and as you can imagine this was so incredibly devastating and disappointing for Wesley's family. They were outraged and absolutely disgusted that McKilligan was getting away with sexually abusing Wesley and so they decided to use this anger to try and make a change in the law. The Neely family started working alongside the lead detective in Wesley's case, Detective Superintendent Trevor Fordy, and also a local newspaper called The Chronicle on a campaign called the Never Again campaign. And essentially, the campaign's aim was to tighten loopholes in sex offender legislations in the UK. Because as I understand it, prior to this in the UK, so when the Sex Offenders Register was first introduced in September of 1997, it was decided that only individuals who had actually been convicted of a sexual crime could be put on the Sex Offenders Register. So if you are convicted of rape, you will go on the register. But what about crimes such as this one, where there's not necessarily solid evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that rape occurred, but there is evidence to strongly suggest that regardless, this crime was still sexually motivated. As we know, McKilligan's rape conviction was ultimately quashed due to a lack of evidence, but let's be honest, it's still very clear that whether Wesley was raped or not, his murder was sexually motivated. McKilligan was a paedophile who had a history of assaulting young children, so of course this crime was sexually motivated. So Wesley's family felt that that in itself should still warrant him and individuals like him having to go on the sex offenders register. So yes, they campaigned for a change in the law, they started a petition which collected countless signatures and they received so much support for this campaign from members of the public and so the campaign went to parliament and thankfully they were successful. In 2001 it was announced that changes would be made to sex offender laws so that those convicted of murder, kidnapping, false imprisonment or malicious wounding would be put on the sex offenders register if a sexual motive for the crime is proved. Unfortunately because McKilligan was convicted of his crimes before these adjustments to the laws were put in place that means that he won't be on the sex offenders register if he is ever released which is so bloody frustrating but at least they are in place to protect other children and adults from other individuals like McKilligan in future and speaking of being released McKilligan's minimum sentence of 20 years in prison is actually up now. I think it ended in 2018 and so he immediately applied for parole but he was denied and I believe he may have applied again since, possibly last year, but again he was denied. I think he is allowed to apply every couple of years or so but as of today he still remains in prison and I for one hope that his request for parole continues to be denied because in my opinion he poses way too much of a danger to children to be considered for release. I think it's just too big a risk to ever let him out. But that is it for this case. That is the case of Wesley Neely, an absolutely tragic case. Wesley was just 11 years old. He was just a happy little boy who had his whole life ahead of him and this monster cruelly took it away. But as heartbreaking as Wesley's story is, obviously there was something so positive to come out of it. The tightening of the sex offender laws and the sex offender register in the UK which of course can only ever be a good thing. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments down below. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.